Today we're going to talk about quantitative energy problems. We've been talking about energy um, diagrams, um, time temperature diagrams, or heating and cooling curves, and now we're going to look at how we use those to actually solve problems. So again, quantitative means we're going to use numbers with the, the energy bar charts we did, of course, just used sort of a description, and now this is much more exact and precise. So we do have definite um, numbers that can go with these energy changes that we're going to talk about. And like you learned in the heat versus temperature video, the energy depends not just on the change in temperature, but also the amount of the substance that we're talking about. And so we've sort of mentioned that a few times in some questions and things that you've done. But um, again, it has to do with what's changing, the temperature and the or the phase of matter, and then how much of the substance there is. To keep things simple, we're going to mainly talk about water and look at the numbers that are associated with changes in water or changes in state of water and temperature of water. Um, but just keep in mind, you could do this with any substance. Um, the numbers are just going to be different. Everything has a different constant. And we'll look at those numbers here in just a bit. So I'm going to just sort of set up with you what you need to do when you get ready to try to solve these problems. First thing I want you to do is always sketch out a heating or a cooling curve. And that's just gonna be your roadmap for, um, for the rest of the problem. When you get that sketched out, I also want you to mark the starting and the ending points. So if something in the problem is gonna tell you, you know, this is where we are at the beginning, this is where we are at the end. So mark those on your graph. And again, we're gonna do a couple of these. Um, and then the last thing, the important thing, why well, you have to do these two steps, is that tells you how to set up your calculations. For every section of the graph, of the curve that you have between your starting and your ending points, you're going to have to do a separate calculation and then combine those. So this, in my experience, when I've taught this before, this is where people have trouble. They try to do one calculation. and some of them are one calculation problems, but very, very often you'll have to go through more than one calculation to figure this out. So um, let's look at your heating and cooling curves. And if you took the notes like I asked you to yesterday, then um, you've probably already got this basic graph um, in your notes. Today, add these numbers to it. So um, that's going to help you again with with figuring out these problems. And I'm not sure how well you can see this on, on the screen, um, but I've color coded it here as we work through this. And so the blue goes with this part of the graph, the purple is this part, the pink color here is this part, orange is this part, and so on. So I've done just a heating curve. Remember, you could do a cooling curve, it's gonna start at the top and come down, but the sections are the same and the numbers are the same. So as you know, you've got um, different things happening at different points along the graph. So temperature here is on the y-axis. And if I look at these, I know from what we did yesterday that the flat part is a phase change and the sloped part is a temperature change. Since we're just talking about water, um, I automatically know what these temperatures are. So I'm going to add those to my graph. So water, in this case, would be melting. If we were going the opposite direction, we could also say freezing at zero degrees. So I know that this lower plateau, this lower flat part is at zero degrees Celsius. Water boils at 100 degrees. And so I know that's this upper phase change. And I'm just gonna do this so I can trace straight across a little better. My line's not real straight. So that point on my graph is 100 degrees. And so if I have temperature changes in this area or this area or this area, I know that um, I can figure out where they are on the graph based on what these two temperatures are. So um, I also put in on this graph what's changing. So as we go through the graph, we can only change one thing at a time. And hopefully, again, you got that from the, from the lesson that we looked at yesterday. So on the slopes, temperature's changing. So we were talking, I have been talking about temperature as ETH, 
thermal energy. On the flat parts, the state of matter or the phase is changing or the interaction energy. So we've been calling that EPH. This little triangle here just means a change. We call it delta. Um, so this is a change in phase energy or interaction energy. We've got another slope, which means it's a temperature change. We have another flat part, which means it's a phase change. And then finally, we have another slope, which means a temperature change. Again, it doesn't matter what substance you're, you're talking about for the most part. Um, you'll change one thing at a time, and you'll go through them in this order. If you're heating up, it has to be, um, it has to get to its melting point before it can melt, then melting happens. It'll have to get to its boiling point before it can boil, then boiling happens, the phase change itself. And then if we boil all the water away and keep adding energy, that gas can also continue to heat up. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, the numbers that we've got. It takes different amounts of energy to do each of these changes. And so if I'm looking at um, the solid here for ice, it takes 2.1 joules of energy. That J stands for joules. For every gram of water, that I heat up by one degree Celsius. So if I have two grams of water, it's gonna take twice that, or 4.2. If I have one gram of water and I'm heating it up by two degrees Celsius, it's gonna take twice that. So what I'm saying here is, I multiply this number by the number of grams I'm heating, and also by the amount that the temperature's changing to, to figure out how much the, the total energy change is. So this is the amount of energy for every single gram and every single degree that that water heats up in this case. Again, I'm saying heating up because this is a heating curve. It would also do the same thing if you're releasing water or releasing energy if the water's cooling down. So at this point, um, notice these units of measurement are a little bit different. When I have a slope, I have grams and degrees Celsius on the bottom. So these are temperature changes, and so that includes the temperature change. And the same is true for this um, as liquid and as steam. But when I get to these flat parts, notice this is just the number of joules for every gram. The temperature is not changing during a phase change, so I don't have any um, temperature component of this constant. So what I find out here is it takes 334 joules for every gram of solid ice that in this case I'm melting, or it's gonna release that if liquid ice is turning to, to solid. But 334 joules for every gram to melt the ice. Notice for the liquid, the number's almost twice what it is for the solid. It takes a lot more energy to heat up or to cool down liquid water. That's why it's such a good insulator, it's used as a coolant lots of times because it can absorb a lot of energy without changing temperature a whole lot. Um, so 4.18 joules for every gram of water that I'm heating up by one degree Celsius. If I need more grams or change it by more degrees, then I'm just going to multiply. And this would also make sense if you think about the states of matter. It takes 2,260 joules to change one gram of liquid water into steam. So compare those two numbers. And when we're looking at energy bar charts, we also said, you know, there's a lot more difference between a liquid and a gas than there is between a solid and a liquid in terms of spacing. And you can see that it takes a lot more energy to get a gram of water to change to liquid water to change to steam than it does to get a gram of um, solid water to change into liquid water. And finally, we don't use this one too much because usually we just let the gas kind of escape. But if you have the question or the problem that involved um, a, a change in temperature of the gas once everything was um, evaporated, that's two joules for every gram and every degree Celsius, kind of similar to the solid. So keep those in mind as we work through these problems. Now, I think as with most things, the easiest way to teach you this is just to show you an example. Um, it'll probably take a couple of videos because I'm limited on my time per video. We'll go ahead and do this first one and then just don't forget to come back and, and look at the next examples as well. 
So the question might be something like this. How much energy is required to heat 250 grams of water from room temperature at 25 degrees, so I automatically know that's liquid water, to 77 degrees Celsius? Now, looking at my advice here, first thing I want to do is sketch out the heating or the cooling curve. And this doesn't have to be a great work of art. I'm just going to sketch this out. This is the energy added over time, so sometimes I'll say time, and this is my temperature, and the energy or the temperature is increasing, so I'm going to draw a heating curve. It's going up. I know that this is at zero, and this is at 100 degrees, and this is, of course, Celsius. So I'm just going to sketch this out. I start at 25 degrees which is eh, between zero and 100, but closer to zero, about right there. And I'm ending in this particular problem at 77 degrees. So that's, let's say about right there again, just to give you an idea of where you are. I know I'm still between zero and 100. So there's my start. This is my end point. And then I've got to set up a calculation for every section of the curve between my starting and ending points. So this one's pretty simple. I'm only on one part of the curve. And by section of the curve, I mean every time I change directions. So this is a section. This is a section, the flat part. This slope is another section. There's another section, that flat part. And this slope is my final section of the curve. But this is one part of the curve, so it's one calculation, which makes my life a little bit easier. Now, there is an equation for this, um, but really I don't think you need it. Um, Q is the energy, and that's what I'm trying to find, how much energy. Um, M is mass, C is the constant, and delta T is the temperature change. So if I'm looking at this part of the graph, that correlates with this liquid part here, which means the constant that I'm going to use is the 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. So the energy is equal to, I'm going to just write my constant there in the middle, 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. I look for the mass of the water which is 250 grams. And I look for the temperature change. Now that's important. It's not the final or the initial temperature. It's the difference between the two. So 77 minus 25 is a difference of 52 degrees Celsius. So the energy is equal to the mass times the constant, times the temperature change. Now notice what else happens here. I'm big on units. The grams cancel the grams. The degrees Celsius cancel the degrees Celsius. And so I've got my final answer there in units of joules. And that tells me that um, I've got my problem set up right. So I'm just going to do my calculation. 250 times 4.18 times 52 and I get 54,340. Now, your favorite thing, those sig figs. If I look at my numbers, this just has two sig figs. That has three, that has two, so I've multiplied. So I'm using my least um, number of sig figs in any of those numbers that are multiplied together. So my final answer here is just gonna be rounded to two significant figures. So that's 54, that's a three, so it stays a four there. And then these last zeros become placeholders. So the answer is 54,000 joules. Again, that's just a little one-step problem. Not too, not too bad so far. Um, I'm going to stop this video here because I'm just about out of time. Um, watch the next video, and I'm just going to show you some more examples. Um, when you feel like you're ready, you can go on to the practice problems. But... Um, you can just keep watching those examples until you feel like you've got a better handle on it. But definitely watch some of that next video because we're going to do some of the more complicated examples with that one. So I'll see you in just a bit.